I used to be a particle physicist. Sadly, I left before it became cool to become a particle physicist. This is one of the collisions I observed from my PhD at Fermilab. And in that past life, the stringent criteria for being certain about a new discovery, like the Higgs boson that made headlines at CERN, is the five sigma confidence level. Here's the famous bell curve with the sigma levels drawn along the bottom. You can see that five sigma is way out in the tails with a very, very low probability of occurring by chance. It means we think there's only a one in 3.5 million chance that the signal could have been seen if there were no Higgs. Now that I'm a climate scientist, I dream of such certainty. We're studying an enormously complex planet. I'm going to talk about some of the reasons there's uncertainty in climate science, some of the problems that's causing between science and society, and what I think we can do about it. But I'll start with some things we are certain about. The Earth's energy budget is out of balance. There's more energy coming in than going out. So the planet is storing it up. Now, that's not unusual in itself, only that we're helping to tip the scales. That extra energy means that the atmosphere and the surface of the ocean have warmed, making the hottest days warmer and more frequent and the coldest days less frequent. As the oceans heat up, they expand, and ice on the land in glaciers and the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets have also been melting into the oceans and breaking off in icebergs faster than they've been replaced by new snow. So global average sea level is rising. How about the future? We predict more of the same. We're confident the world will get warmer, shifting the hottest days and the coldest days further, and that parts of the world will have heavier rainfall, such as in the wet tropical regions. Global average sea level will continue to rise, making the extreme highs in sea level higher and more frequent. We're confident that our activities have been the dominant cause of warming since the middle of the last century. But it's not only climate scientists that are certain. You may not know this, but more and more climate skeptics agree with us too. There are some people who don't believe CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and they likely never will. But in my experience, more and more climate skeptics in the blogosphere, media, and politics absolutely agree we're having an effect on climate. They question only the details, like how fast the warming will be and how we should mitigate the risks. So how do we know what we're talking about? Well, our big picture predictions come from our observations of the planet and fundamental physical understanding, some of which is over 200 years old. But the details of the predictions, just how fast temperatures will rise and sea levels will rise, exactly which parts of the world will experience heavier rainfall, must come from computer models. Here's a map of the world in a climate model. Now, this model is a bit old, about 15 years, but it's still used. And you can see that the world's been simplified. It looks kind of blocky, almost like an early digital camera. We need computer models because we don't have a miniature Earth to play with. It's not only climate science that has that difficulty. If you wanted to study, say, the evolution of galaxies, it's a bit easier to write computer code than to create 100 million stars. At the heart of climate models are basic laws of physics, like Newton's laws of motion. And over time, we've added more and more physics, chemistry, biology, geology. But a model can never be perfect. By definition, a model is a simplified representation of reality. There's a great saying by this friendly-looking statistician called George Box, who sadly died last year, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think the saying is so important, I named my blog after it. And not only are all models simplified, but their predictions partly depend on the numbers you plug in. And we can't always know what those numbers should be, say, if they're hard to measure in the real world. So there's uncertainty because models are simplified and they have some unknown inputs. A second reason is that the very definition of climate has uncertainty at its heart. And people often think of weather and climate as being the same thing, but they're not. The weather is the state of the atmosphere around us, the, the temperatures, pressures, and the rainfall that we can measure with instruments. Climate's quite different. We can think of climate as the probability of different types of weather occurring. 
The fact that climate is a statement of probability means two important things. First, that climate is inherently uncertain. A probability is a statement of uncertainty. We predict the most, that the weather will mostly be X and sometimes Y and occasionally Z. Second, it means that climate is a long-term thing because you need a lot of data to estimate a probability. If you're flipping a coin to see if it's fair, 50-50 heads or tails, you need to do it a lot of times before you can be sure. And in just the same way, we need 30 years or more of weather records to get just one data point of climate. So there's uncertainty because climate is a probability, which makes it uncertain, which means we need a lot of data to test our models. And my research focuses on both these sources of uncertainty that I've mentioned, the limitations of models and testing their predictions. Uncertainty doesn't mean we don't know anything. In fact, I'd argue that uncertainty is the engine of science because it drives our search to understand the universe. But the misunderstanding and misrepresentation of uncertainty is damaging this relationship between climate science, the media, and society because climate science is both complex and highly politicized. The first problem uncertainty brings is the extra difficulty for experts in explaining the results and for non-experts in understanding them. For example, over the past 17 years or so, there's been a slowdown or even a pause in the rate of warming of the atmosphere. Now, we're confident that the climate is still changing because the oceans are still warming, the land losing ice, the sea level rising, and we predict that the atmosphere will start to warm again after this temporary blip. Now, we think there are various contributing factors to this pause. It could be partly a movement, a change in the movement of heat around the planet, um, a dip in the brightness of the sun, some reflection of the sun by pollution and volcanic eruptions. But because we need to use computer models to understand it, and because 17 years is not that long when it comes to climate, it takes time to explain this, and also we don't know the exact contributions of each. Clearly, this is not simple soundbite science. And the second problem is that scientists in any area of cutting-edge research disagree with each other. If the media or public don't expect that, it can cause confusion. But worse still, because climate science is politicized, these disagreements are often sold as proof of unreliable science, as an argument to ignore us scientists until we've got it all sorted out. For example, some scientists predict that global average sea level rise under the highest greenhouse gas emission scenarios will likely be 20 to 30 inches by the end of the century. Now, some other scientists predict it will be very likely be three to five feet and possibly over six feet. That's quite a difference. And the reason for it is that the two groups think about the problem in two different ways. The first use methods based in physics, and the second in statistics. And I think that's an interesting story to tell, because we don't yet know the best approach. We might like to think of science as a neat, orderly book of facts, but it's not. It's like searching for the right path in a fog, and it takes time to find out which was the right one. The third problem is that scientific uncertainty allows people to spin our results. We had a press conference for a project I was in called Ice2C, which made predictions of global average sea level rise using those physics methods. Some journalists reported our results as sea level rise to be less severe than feared because they compared our results to those higher statistical studies. Others reported the same press conference as risk from rising sea levels worse than feared because they chose to compare our results to the previous report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which, like us, used the physics methods, but didn't tally every possible part of future sea level rise. A third website went for the end of London as we know it. It's no wonder the public are confused. Each media outlet tells the story it wants to tell. But I think we scientists haven't always helped. We haven't always sold the idea of uncertainty as not only inevitable, but even exciting. And we've sometimes oversimplified our communication. That pause in the warming of the atmosphere surprised the media and public, even though scientists always expected it could happen in the short term. And that's because we focus too much on talking about the long-term average predictions, which smooth out the year-to-year -year changes. And we haven't always done a good job at being available. 
how many climate scientists can you name? Where do you get your climate science from? Is it interviews with scientists? More likely the media, politicians, activists, whether environmental or skeptical. And we've kept our heads mostly below the parapet for fear of attracting fire and communicating a complex science in a politicized atmosphere. There's certainly days I've hidden away, but we need to be braver. And things are getting better. There are more of us online than ever, giving interviews, giving talks, trying to explain those nuances of the science. But we can do better. My colleagues Ed Hawkins, Doug McNeil and I wrote a journal article about the slowdown in atmospheric warming called Pause for Thought, which we're very proud to say is the first journal article to use Twitter handles for the author contact information. In that, we asked our colleagues to join us online and in the media, because the more that do, the easier it gets, the less we have to speak outside our comfort zone, the more we can support each other. And I'd especially love it if more female scientists could get out there. Our society often rewards men for being competitive. And I like to think that the presence of more women would help naturally move things from a climate debate to a climate conversation. And for that conversation, I'd like to invite you, the public, to come and join us, to come and find us on Twitter. The, the small number of us that blog is growing. There are hundreds of us out on Twitter. But at the moment, we're mostly engaging with people who are most passionate the environmentalists, the dissenters. And we want to talk to more people in the middle ground, the fence-sitters, the understandably confused. So I'm curating a Twitter list of climate scientists. It's a directory of researchers actively studying climate change and its effects. Physical scientists, computer scientists, statisticians. And you can find it from my Twitter page, Flimsin. So far, I've added 250 climate scientists. If you are a climate scientist or if you know one, please tweet me to add to the list. And if you want to ask a climate science a question, discuss a news article to, to talk about their new results, then just have a read through the biographies and pick some scientists to ask. I hope this list will grow and that the conversations it starts might help us to deal better with uncertainty in climate science and maybe even with the messy business of science itself. So if you're confused about climate, puzzled about the pause, surprised about sea level, or just uncertain about uncertainty, please do come and find us. We'd love to talk. Thank you.